It's been a historic year in the U.S. ETF marketplace. Not only did ETFs celebrate their 30-year anniversary of existence, but certain categories like actively managed ETFs hit all-time records by product count and asset flows. So what comes next for ETF investors? Here to help us explain what's going on and look ahead, we've got Mike Akins, the founder at ETF Action, and he's also a regular ETF battles judge. You've seen him on the show. Mike, great to see you. Welcome back to ETF Guide TV. It's great to be here, Ron. Thanks for having me. So roughly 40% of the stocks inside the S&P 500 and Russell 1000, uh, both large cap indexes, are down this year. And uh, it's really telling about what's going on underneath the surface. We've also seen weakness in bonds along with real estate. Uh, so are there 2023 tax loss harvesting opportunities? What do you think? You know, I think that's the great thing about the ETF market and what it brings to investors as opportunities is generally there's almost always something that is underperforming. And if you have the right tools to identify that and map out tax loss op harvesting opportunities, most years there's opportunities to take advantage of that, whether it's broadly at the ETF or category level or more direct into the um, fund, into the single security level. Um, just uh, maybe a couple examples I can show your folks kind of first to hit home on that idea of, you know, the difference between um, a market cap portfolio, right? The S&P 500, as we can see here, is up 20% year to date. I open up SPY and I compare it to the equal weight version of the S&P 500, we'll get a sense of that large outperformance. So I'm just going to go to the performance tab here, look at year to date, and you can see that the market cap, the S&P 500 weighted by the size of the companies is up over 20% as of um, last Friday. And But the equal weight version where it's equal weighting every single component is only up 5%. Wow. So really kind of drive that home. What we can do is we can give a visual of what that looks like when we think about it from a um, single stock portfolio. So I'm going to hop in and look at all of the underlying constituents of the S&P 500. This is going to load up a heat map for us. And, and right now it's showing. And, and just, just let our audience know here, this is the ETF action dashboard that that you're looking at. So, Correct. Yeah. So this is our ETFaction.com website. And then vast majority of the tools I'll show for demonstrations today are completely free. All you got to do is set up an account though there are certain tools as we get into some more detail like this example where um, you do have to be a paid subscriber to access. Um, but if we take a look at the portfolio visualizer for the S&P 500 SPY, um, what we'll see is if I change this to year to date, this is the year to date returns of all of the components. And just visually, that's a whole lot of green, right? I'm gonna make that full screen. There's a whole lot of green, obviously a lot, a lot of technology, Consumer discretionaries, comm services have had a great year. A little, a little less on the energy, utilities, um, industrials, healthcare. But by and large, I'd say that's, you know, if I look at it visually that way um, on a market cap, because all these boxes right now are scaled by the size they are in the S&P 500. So obviously Apple's the largest, followed by Microsoft here. Um, what really I think becomes interesting is if I change that, and I scale it instead of by the weight of each security in the index itself and just say, let me see it equal. It's a whole different visual, yeah. right? So going to that whole idea of 40% of the names, um, it looks, you know, 50-50. In this case, we know just based on what you and I did while we were talking, it's technically right now 40% of the names in the S&P 500 are negative year to date. And it really just illustrates that. So, there is a huge opportunity if you own a lot of single companies to think about doing some tax loss harvesting, whether you sell out of that company and buy a sector specific ETF that that company is involved with, or just kind of broadly harvest a lot of your losing individual names and buy broad based indexes like the SPY or QQQ, depending on the types of securities you're owning. There's definitely a lot of opportunity out there right now. Yeah, that, that, that makes total sense. Or go from an index fund to an active ETF or vice versa. 
you know, so yep. there's lots of uh, ways to, to make that sort of move. Um, so there's been a lot of talk, as you know, in the ETF marketplace about spot Bitcoin ETFs, spot Ethereum ETFs. And so I guess the question is, how has the ga this particular category been performing? And uh, what is your outlook for spot crypto ETFs in the U.S.? So let's start with just where we're at in the ETF market, right? There is not currently, as we all know, a spot um, cryptocurrency ETF for Bitcoin or any of the other digital currencies that are on the marketplace. There are, however, a number of futures-based products um, tracking that. So if we start with that, what I did is I went to our ETF dashboard category flows. I'm set on the category asset class. You can see we have an asset class for cryptocurrency. So that there's currently 18 funds that track a cryptocurrency. Right now, it's either Bitcoin, Ethereum, or a mix of the two. Um, and thank you, one thank point, you, by the way, Mike, for breaking out that category. Because in a lot of other databases, cryptos are just kind of, you know, put together <laughs> with alternatives or commodities. They're not, they're not segregated completely into their own category. So kudos to you guys for doing that. Yeah, thank you. Um, so if you look at that, we have seen. Um, just under 600 million in AUM and flows year to date, 2.6 billion um, since Bito, B-I-T-O, the first crypto futures-based product launched. If I dive into that and look under the hood, so I'm just going to load up those 18 ETFs into our database. So now I can see these 18 ETFs. What I'll find is that the overwhelming majority of the money is currently in Bito. First mover advantage. It was the first futures product to hit the marketplace, and it gathered all of the attention. But relatively speaking, at, at 1.6 billion in total AUM, not a lot going on there, right? If I were to go under the hood and look at the flows, I'm gonna change my dashboard template to fund flows, and just look at year-to-date flows. Not surprising, the vast majority of the flows have also been captured by BITO. Um, so, you know, there's definitely some appetite for these strategies, but nothing compared to what you might see when the, the spot strategy comes to the marketplace, which is just a pure way to do that. And I thought maybe one of the ways to illustrate that for your audience was to look at gold based products. So I'm going to go back to my category flows and I'm going to go to my commodities um, dashboard and you can see that there's 14 gold based strategies in the marketplace, 94 billion in AUM. Um, they've had a little outflows year to date, but in you know a very sizable category. If I dive into this portfolio, these 14 ETFs, what I wanna illustrate is that the vast majority of these, I'm gonna switch my template tab to our classification system, are long only strategies. So the largest ones are long only, meaning they're spot strategies. They're physical gold trusts that have the gold bars stored in a safe um, at a custodian, and they track nearly perfectly or basically perfectly with the spot gold price. There are, however, a few of the futures-based products. So you can see here, 94 billion, 14 ETFs. If I set a filter and say, I just want to see the derivatives type products remove all of the long only strategies. Only 244 million. Wow. Right. So out of $94 billion tracking gold products, basically a hundred percent, 99% of it is in the, um, the spot strategies that are um, physically holding it. And I think that's what people are so excited about because the efficiency there's a lot of inefficiencies of future strategies, contango and backwardation, and just tracking error relative to the spot price. Whereas if you have a cold storage of Bitcoin or Ethereum, um, it should, through the ETF wrapper, perfectly track the spot price and provide a much more, um, lot more use cases and a lot, much more efficient structure for investors. So I think that's what all the excitement is about. I think it, using the gold market as a way to illustrate that um, kind of drives home that point. Yeah, that's a good good illustration. And it shows a lot of p upside potential in terms of asset growth for spot crypto 
linked ETFs. What about the, uh, you know, the question I wanted to ask you that that sometimes comes up is since cryptos trade 24 seven, they never shut down. Those markets are always open. You know, how, how would the ETF structure deal with that? Obviously, ETFs operate according to stock market trading hours. So any any insight on that, how uh, the me mechanics of how that would work? Yeah. So the spot Bitcoin ETF or any ETF is going to it's going to trade on the hours of the listed exchange. Right. So there's a bunch of spot um, crypto ETFs over in Europe and other um, foreign exchanges, and they just trade during the hours of that exchange, which means that if you're not going to be able to trade on these 24 seven. Um, so every morning when the market's open here in the U.S., if there is a spot Bitcoin ETF, that opening price is going to immediately go up or down, just like it does for the S&P 500 based on futures trading overnight, right? So there'll be futures tradings on these ETFs if they get large enough. But in theory, you're only going to be able to trade them during U.S. market hours, which means that if you really want to be able to get in and out on random hours, the ETF is not going to be the structure that you're that that's best for you. You're much better off holding the the big the Bitcoin or other digital currency um, directly. So what you're saying is you could have big gaps up or big gaps down at the open, correct? Absolutely. Okay. Which is not un, not uncommon for ETFs in general for any market, right? I mean, you know, on when bad news comes out overnight, you know, we'll wake up to the S and P 500 opening up down significantly. Yeah. Um, now, of course, with Bitcoin, um, take and put a multiplier of who knows what on that because it's that much more volatile. But um, it is a, it's a great question, and it's something to know that that will not be the case. You won't be able to just wake up in the middle of the night and say, I want out of my Bitcoin if you hold it via an ETF. You've got to wait for exchange hours. It just depends how Satoshi wakes up in the morning. If he's in a good mood, <laughs> then everything's going to be great. And if it's in a bad mood and he uh, accidentally tripped over his socks – then uh, anything can happen. Exactly. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about uh, some of the key um, investment themes. And I know you, you cover this very closely. I mean, there's a lot of investment themes out there. There's, you know, uh, cloud storage, there's fintech, renewable energy and EVs. And some of these areas have really gotten creamed in 2023. And of course, with a lot of these young, immature markets, there's a lot of uh, growing pains. So uh, what does what your uh, latest analysis tell us? Yeah, I mean, thematic investing, let's just start there, right? Thematic investing has really taken off over the past um, five years. It's really slowed down since the pandemic craze when there was billions of dollars flowing into these strategies. But we still continue to see a number of these thematic type strategies come to market. And I think for good reason, right? I think if you think about what, you know, if you think about sector ETFs, right? Let's just start with sector ETFs. I'm going to go to our sector category here. Um, and we break down sectors into the 11 GIC sectors um, of the S&P 500. The, the GIC sectors being the global industry classification system that S&P and MSCI jointly uh, developed. And we can see there's $646 billion, 314 ETFs across you know, your 11 gig sectors, technology, healthcare, you name it. Um, what we've seen is that as markets continue to evolve, um, it's, it's, everything tends to have a technology bent or a communication services bent, but there's very unique um, companies within those groups, right? So very similar to like Gix has industries, the idea of themes is to go even more niche and capture broader opportunity sets. Yeah. I think that's what the power of this thematic investing is. So here at ETF Action, we break down theme-based investing into two levels. First and foremost, we break it down at the segment level. So we currently have um, nine segments. We have our traditional kind of natural resources, which is going to be um, – a capture of some of your industry, um, industrials, your nuclear type products, things like that, uranium. Um, we have disruptive tech, which is um, all about technology, but broken into more uh, unique categories like cybersecurity or big data 
or the metaverse. What about AI? Multi- Is AI there? A- yeah, so AI right now fits into two buckets. There's two types of AI. There's disruptive tech AI, and there's industrial revolution. It's a good kind of segue. I just to kind of show you quickly, in general, thematic ETFs have not been um, front and center with investors year to date, right? We can see $4.1 billion has come out of them. But we also then break down these categories into 40 plus subgroups, which I think will probably speak to your audience a lot more. This is where you're going to see such things like, you know, if I just sort this by groups, right? Disrupt- disruptive tech has big data, cloud computing, connectivity, cybersecurity. And if I wanted to kind of go down and look, you know, industrial revolution has robotics and AI. You bring that up, it's one of the few groups that has a lot of inflows year to date, right? Yeah. Because that AI connotation. Um, you know, you mentioned, if you just kind of look at it from a flows perspective, very few groups have seen inflows. The ones that have infrastructure, not surprising considered considering what's going on with um, all of the infrastructure spending. Folks are putting money to that. Nuclear has been a very popular to- topic this year. Big data fits nicely into that AI revolution. Um, you know, natural resources. Cannabis is an outlier. It just always has positive inflows despite having negative returns. Um, it's just a very interesting category. But on the flip side, most of these segments have seen outflows, right? Led by clean energy. You mentioned that when you, when you kind of open up the question. If I look at clean energy, a ton of money has come out of this, right? So this is what we're looking at here is flows. But Okay, so the top three with outflows are just because I can't see that on my screen. What are the top three? Oh, yeah. So it's clean energy, uh-huh. cloud computing, cybersecurity, our top three outflows year to date. Got it. Um, Do the trade that makes you puke. <laughs> well, and that's a good point, right? So let's talk about, let's kind of narrow into some of that. Just to, to have an event, what I'm going to do is I'm going to load up every single thematic ETF into my database. So 329 thematic ETFs, 102 billion in assets, um, 4.1 billion in outflows year to date. But now let's take a look at returns. The returns actually speak a very different story. Right. So I'm going to show all of these funds. I'm just going to look at this from a year to date basis. And this is this is not including the leveraged products. The leveraged products are excluded from this, correct? Correct. This I'm just looking at X leverage and inverse. You can add those back in. But um, all of our broad based flows exclude leverage and inverse Got it. strategies. Um, but if I look at it from a return perspective, um, speaking of, you know, crypto, the crypto linked equity ETFs that are tracking blockchain or miners <laughs> are, you know, up a significant amount year to date, right? 144% for VanX. So all the crypto kind of strategies are let's, are leading. Lest we remind our audience at the end of 2022, these were the areas that got creamed the most. Yes, absolutely, right? So, you know, you can kind of really dive into that if you want. Take something like, oh, um, the... Uh, I was going to look for one of the older ones, like Block as an example, right? So I just opened up the Amplify BLOK. It's the largest blockchain ETF. It's got 474 million in AUM. But to get a sense, right, here is that performance chart. If I look at it all time, right, and this is kind of that, you know, late pandemic highs that we saw in the strategy relative to Acqui, um, and then it just came crashing down. And I think, you know, you mentioned it, but if we were to go and look at kind of the valuation return of block, so if I go into my fund data history and look at BLOK, I think it's very telling if we, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go to equity characteristics. I'm going to set this to price sales next 12 months. I'll make this in full screen so you can see it better. Right. But this is where valuations started getting a little carried away. Yeah. Right. And you can see that now valuations have come back more to long term trends and returns have been much more favorable. But I think it's these themes, especially the narrower these themes get, um, you have to really keep an eye on those valuations um, because 
the crowd can get ahead of the get ahead of you on the trade, right? And so you have to be a little bit more nimble and really um, track these strategies because, well, here at ETF Action, we always, you know, advocate, you know, strategically 80% of your portfolio should be kind of set it, forget it, strategic asset allocation in line with your risk objectives. And then you kind of have that 20% where you probably spend 80% of your time um, managing the tweaks to your portfolio based on current environment. And I think thematics are a great example of that. You know, they are not great set it and forget it strategies. If you really like a theme, you should track that theme and when you and set your entry points. Um, but you got to be willing to say, you know, this theme is too hot, right? AI might be an example right now. If we were to look at something like NVIDIA and look at the valuations on that, I'm not suggesting NVIDIA is a, not a good purchase. A lot of people are calling for it to continue to do really well. But if you were to look at those valuations, they're very, very lofty. Yeah. Um, and maybe it grows into that. But hist hist historically, more times than not, it's a sign that it might be time to take some profit. Yeah, for sure. It's better, I think, to be a contrarian, a bottom feeder. Look at some of those beaten down areas where attractive valuations might be more apparent and available and uh, take advantage of that. You know, But it does take a certain mindset uh, to buy something that's out of favor. Not, not all investors can do that. One final thing, Mike, before you take off, I, I know you wanted to touch a little bit on 2023 ETF Asset flows across popular categories. Uh, what is the trend telling us there? Yeah, I think, you know, what's interesting about um, ETF flows is it really gives you an idea of the investor mindset. So I'm just going to reset here real quick and show you at a broad level in our category flows. Um, let this load. It's loading uh, all the flows for every ETF since the inception of the first ETF um, since 1993. But there's a couple of things I wanted to point out. First and foremost, I'm going to go to our categories, and I think if I put this into full screen for you and sort it by year-to-date flows, inflows, all right, you got your normal suspects up top, right? U.S. large cap equity, it's the largest category, represents almost 50% of all ETF assets, a couple of very large fixed income categories. But if I go down here a little further into the top 10, one that jumps out to you is synthetic income, right? So synthetic income ETFs um, has been a trend where there's just this insatiable ass, um, appetite for a little less risk and a lot more income. Yeah. And that's what synthetic incomes are designed to do, right? And if I were to dive in and just give you an idea of how impressive those flows are for the, in the ETF space, I can go down to our synthetic income category, and I'm just going to show you. I love how you've broken this out, too. This is not, you know, marrying it with traditional dividend investing is is not uh, the, 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 no, you know, the right. Very, approach. very different. Yeah. yeah, it's very, very, very different. Um, and I can give you one illustration of that. But this is the growth. Right. So basically, synthetic in income, covered calls, put rights, whatever you want to call it. They've been around in mutual fund form forever. But with kind of the market. Uh, reversal in 2022, it gave these types of ETFs an opportunity to, to see the spotlight. And this is just wild to me, right? So basically, you went from being non-existent three years ago to having over $60 billion in the category um, as of last Friday, November 24th. And you can see just how quickly the category has grown. Yeah. Um, I think just to a similar example on that, if I go back to my category flows page, open that up in full screen for everybody. Buffer ETFs. You know, everybody got burnt a little bit being overextended during um, the, the COVID heydays of the market screaming in 2021 up to kind of unrealistic highs. And then they come crashing down. The, these buffer ETFs cap gains and losses, right? And you can see... This category is $35 billion now. $11 billion of that has come in just this year. So I think you're starting to see kind of that extension of the ETF market growing into some of these non-traditional categories. And probably a great way to close that out is I'm going to go to one of our my favorite category flow pages. We call it our vintage year. 
And what this dashboard does is it breaks out every active ETF by the year that it was launched, right? And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to sort. Wine from... lovers will love this one, vintage. <laughs> so I'm exactly. with you. I'm, I'm, I'll take a Cabernet. Uh, do you have Do you have in here a 1962 uh, Cabernet? <laughs> that would probably be this one fund that was launched <laughs> in 1993 called SPY. Yeah. Um, that, <laughs> that would be your, your oldest vintage year um, that we have on this dashboard. But I think one of the things that's, that's telling here is you can just see this growth, right? So I, I sorted it by year with 2023 being on top. There is now 2023 has more active ETFs than any other year. And yeah. it's been a trend for a while, more and more ETF launches. But something that's been unique about this year, if I dive into that 2023, those 472 ETFs that were launched so far this year. And what I'll, what I'll do is I'm going to go to my ETF Act classification tab. Notice 37,472 ETFs launched this year. I'm going to slide over to the right and I'm just going to set a filter and remove all the passive, just be active ETFs. 361 or 75%, three quarter of all the launches year to date have been active ETFs. Yeah. Now they, I'll tell you they're, they're fully, most of them are fully transparent active, but active nonetheless. And I think, you know, that's definitely a trend of we're starting to see the, um, the asset managers, the traditional asset managers, the Fidelities, the Goldman's, you know, um, they're getting into the space they're, finally. They're getting into the space. Yeah. And you're starting to see that come out in a, in a large way um, in the ETF launches. And I embrace the active nature to the extent that they're competitively priced and they're fully transparent. Um, I'll save my rant for non-transparent ETFs for another day. Um, but I think you're starting to see that in mass and investors are embracing that to the extent that they also stay competitive on price. Did you see MFS is getting into the ETF business? I did. MFS launched the first mutual fund here in the U.S. I think it was in 1924. Yeah, so it's come full wild. circle. Um, that is wild. Yep. I'd like to like to have seen the drawdown of those in 1929. Oh, yeah, definitely. <laughs> I'm sure that they'll give you the data if you ask for it. I'm sure. Um, well, but, yeah, go ahead, Mike. No, it's, yeah, so there's a lot going on. I think just big picture – um, the ETF market, as much as people want to say that it's matured or, you know, the big growth years are behind us, uh, I think the data tells a different story. Um, and the nice thing about the ETF, I think of it as a tool and the markets are ever changing. Therefore, the tools you need to navigate the markets are ever changing, which provides that opportunity. It also provides plenty of risk, right? You want to be careful not to just go out and buy the, um, the latest shiny object. Um, but if you have the right tools to um, track and navigate the ETF market, there sure is a lot of opportunities out there to build portfolios that align to your ideologies, your macro assumptions, your needs, your client needs, all that good stuff. Yeah, I think that'll be our next conversation. We'll dig in more to portfolio construction with ETFs. So we'll put that on our agenda for our next conversation. Thank you so much, Mike, for your insights and sharing your dashboard. Uh, great job. Thanks, Ron. Really appreciate you having me on. Be sure to visit ETFaction.com. Just hit the link in the description section below. Sign up. As Mike indicated, you can get a free account. And whether you're an individual investor, self-managing your own investments, or you're a financial advisor or fiduciary or RAA managing assets on behalf of clients, listen, all of you can benefit from the tools that are available at ETF Action. So check it out. Again, ETFaction.com. I'm Ron Legge with ETF Guide. Thanks for tuning in. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and join our community. We'll see you on the next episode.